Hello, everyone, and welcome to this for this evening's event, uh, 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism and this live event, this live gathering. Um, today, we're exploring mixed, it, it, today we're exploring mixed and multiracial identities with Catherine Inglis and Danielle, Danielle Wolf, and we're really glad that you're here. Welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Adele Halliday. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. So welcome once again. Um, we'll start our program in a few moments, um, but first, just a little bit of background about the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism in case this is your first live event. Uh, this live event is part of a 40-day program that features daily written reflections every day with the exception of Sundays. And each day's reflection offers opportunities for learning, faith reflection, and ideas for action. The idea is that the writings were written by people from across the United Church, and the reflections are posted on the United Church website one week at a time. And in addition to these daily events, there are these, uh, the daily reflections, there are these live events. And these live events are running every Tuesday and they're being recorded so they can be viewed at any time. We also have several books that are featured each and every week, uh, books on anti-racism that are available through the United Churches Bookstore. Um, this week's book of the week is called Healing Haunted Histories, A Settler Discipleship of Decolonization. And uh, the link is posted in the chat in case you're interested in exploring that book further. If you would like to order any books that are available from the United Church Bookstore, um, you can use the code 40 days to receive a discount of 20% of orders of two or more books up until the end of, uh, end of November. So a couple more weeks to get that discount. Um, for today's live event, Catherine and Danielle will be breaking people into small groups for discussion time. If you identify as Indigenous or racialized and you would like to be in a separate group for discussion, please send a private message directly to Brian Mitchell Walker. So please send a private message to Brian Mitchell Walker if you're Indigenous or racialized and would like to be in a separate group for conversation. Um, Danielle and Catherine are going to introduce themselves. So I welcome, offer a welcome to both of them uh, and they'll share a bit more of themselves. In the meantime, I'll just post a few more links into the chat about where you can find um, the newsletter in case you wanted to sign up for that, where you can find um, and where you can find the overall website for the 40 days of engagement. So we're really glad you're here. Welcome once again, and over to you, Catherine and Danielle. Thanks, Adele, and welcome everyone. My name is Catherine, and I use she, her pronouns. And I am Danielle, and I also use she, her pronouns. So Danielle and I have been, uh, we met only a few weeks ago, and we're going to be uh, facilitating conversations with you, but also with each other uh, over the next hour or so. And so what we're going to be doing is um, we're going to let you get to know us through our questions to each other. So other than giving, your, uh, or giving you our pronouns um, and our names, we're now going to go into our actual pieces why we are here today. So I'm going to start with the first question. So Danielle, how do you self-identify -identi when you're relating to race? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so uh, that's an evolving process, and that's something that I, I'm looking forward to talking about tonight. Um, the way I currently self-identify is a mixed race woman, um, and I live in Ottawa currently, and I'm from Toronto originally. Um, yeah, so in terms of like the terminology that I've used, it's changed over time. Mixed race is what I use right now. Um, I've tried on the hat of biracial because I think like the influence of uh, American um, identities and, and African-American or um, and white mixed race identities tends to sort of create a biracial identity that many people subscribe to. But my background is that my mom is from Guyana which is um, a, a Caribbean country within South America. And it's also a really mixed race place. And so my mom, there's even terminologies for her mix in terms of having um, black and Indian, they call that Dugla. And so she identifies in different ways, depending on the context. So 
given all of that and all the sort of mixedness on her side and then my dad is white Canadian many generations um, I've always identified as mixed race and I've played with different terms over time just um, becoming more or less comfortable depending on the context um, yeah I guess and the other thing um, I guess I would say beyond sort of racial identity a sort of appearance is that sometimes I talk about how other people might see me. Um, so if I were to describe what I look like to people, um, there's terms called white passing. Um, and what I have um, had to think about is, well, what does that mean? And there's a whole lot of history in the concept of passing as a mixed race person. So um, when you look at me, I don't know what you see. Um, and it really has a lot to do also with who you are and what you see in me. Um, and so I've, uh, as I've grown and had to negotiate different professional situations and other contexts, I realized I think I'm passing in this situation and this person does not know that I have any other background other than white. Um, and so I realized that was a thing and I had to learn some of the history of that concept. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit further um, in a little bit. And, and then I started to explore the concept of white presumed and white assumed. And so I started to realize that that speaks more to the person who is making the judgment call as to whether they assume that I am white and therefore they've made a decision about my identity versus I, I'm not trying to pass but there are certain issues in terms of racism and history that have caused people to try to pass as white, even when they're mixed race. So yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there. And I'd like to ask you, Catherine, um, would you like to introduce yourself in terms of how you self-identify related to your race? Sure, thanks, Danielle. And thanks for uh, giving us some of the background on the terminology that, that is ever evolving and that is always changing. And um, so right now, uh, I identify, I generally do use the term biracial, um, though, like you, uh, my mom also comes from Guyana. She is Indo-Guyanese uh, primarily, but we know that like many people in, in uh, Guyana and Trinidad in a lot of the, in many places, no one is, is um, one, of one background or one race. So my mom is also uh, Indo-Guyanese. My dad's family is pretty waspy um, from Manitoba. They're both Presbyterians, uh, which they had in common. My mom's family had been, um, uh, been part of the Canadian mission, Presbyterian mission in Guyana. And so I was Presbyterian on both sides. Um, so, so that's that's definitely part of my identity and growing up in a place, in a uh, setting where both sides of my family had the same religious background, even though culturally we were all very different. So um, it also depends on context for me about how I identify. So I was an elementary school teacher for the last 22 years. And depending on the kids who I was with, I would often use the terminology that the kids use. So sometimes the kids would be like, oh, are you brown? And I'd be like, oh, I'm half brown um, or I'm beige. I loved using beige because that's kind of a fun one. Um, <laughs> so, so it depended on, on who was asking. Sometimes if I wanted to be a bit more formal, I might say something like I'm a biracial cisgendered woman who, uh, where my mother is Indo-Guyanese and my father is Scottish Canadian. And I would give those backgrounds. Um, whereas other times I'm just tired and I might just say I'm half black and or half brown and half white. So it depends on, on that context. Um, I had a really great opportunity um, as a younger person to live and work in India. And in India, there are actually people, a whole group of people um, who identify based on their mixed race heritage. And so in India, they call them the Anglos and the Anglo-Indians, and they're the half brown, half white, or half Indian and half white, mostly um, descendants of British and uh, Scottish um, army folk who had been stationed in India, who coupled with, with uh, women in India. And so I really found that exciting that there was actually a name for, for our people. Um, and so when I was there, uh, if I got to know someone well enough and they said, what are you? I'd say, oh, I'm basically Anglo, even though I wasn't. Um, but it's the same kind of idea. And that was one that people there could relate to. So 
uh, I, I know we're going to talk about a lot about context and location and ages and things as we go on through this next uh, little while, but that I think, um, I think that was what was missing for me as a child was not necessarily having the language because there it's, it's always two parts rather than, than one whole. And, um, you know, as, as a student, when I remember learning about Louis Riel and thinking, wow, this is cool that the Métis have their own identity of, of being their own people uh, as a mixed uh, community. And, uh, and so I, I remember being, you know, really enamored by that as well. Thanks for that. I, and I don't know what your feelings are on this, but I know, like, as you mentioned, two halves instead of a whole is something that I think a lot of mixed race people often think about because the terminology that people use in reference to mixed race people is often I'm half this and half that. And then when we have kids, I, you know, I've married a white British man. So my kids say, well, I'm one quarter Guyanese and I'm one quarter, you know, and, and then we start to realize why are we breaking people up into these segments, right? And if once your math gets to a certain point, it doesn't make any sense, right? But it is influenced by a lot of the history of sort of the one drop rule. Um, so I don't know whether everyone's familiar with that, but in the context of particularly the, the United States and, and other places where it was very segregated, that if you were um, considered to have one drop of black blood, then you were considered black. And that was meant to keep people oppressed and so that people couldn't get out of where they were based on their racial identity. And so that's where the concept of passing came, that people tried to dilute themselves and their, their lineage to try to get whiter over time. And I would say that while that sounds like historical, it still happened even in my family, like my brother and I kind of joke like, well, we're we are the product of what they were trying to do, right? Is that because Guyana has a British colonial history, there was a hierarchy created based on skin color. And so, you know, if you married someone lighter and lighter each time, you eventually got a lighter product. Um, and my own grandmother, who is um, half black and half Indian, she was very, in, had a lot of internalized racism. So there were a lot of things that she shared that I was sort of like, how can you say that given your identity? But when you look at it through that colonial lens, it makes a lot of sense. So now when we use terms like, you know, mixed and half and quarter, I sort of say like, we're just recreating a lot of that, that systemic racism and historical racism when we use that language and how can we um, change the language? And that's something that I talk about with my daughters. I don't know what your experience with that, Catherine. Well, um, I remember one of the first times I met someone outside of my family who was the same as me. Uh, it was a guy at university and his, um, his family, his dad was Indian and his mom was white. And when we kind of figured that out about each other, because it's not like you're at a university party and you walk up and they're like, hey, what's your background? Um, but it was after a little while, I think there was kind of what's the deal with you? Are you the same as me? And, you know, I don't know who started the conversation. But after that, he said, you know, hey, you're not half and half, you're actually double. And, um, and then he started using this, this term of being a double. And uh, I mean, he also used the word breed, which was not cool. But he, this idea that we were not just two halves, but rather two holes that made a, for a double was a really intriguing one. And and uh, you know, it still sticks with me to this day. So yeah, how we how we use it is is so it just keeps changing. And I, I'm leaning. I've been leaning more into mixed. Um, I'd say in the last couple of years, um, it's. I find it's just also a little easier just to say I'm mixed mm -hmm. um, than having to then break down um, within my within my union. Though we have uh, voluntary self identification on when we're applying for programs or, or anything. And so um, under the label of racialized, they give a spot to actually write in, how do you identify? Which is a, is a new thing, but I find sometimes I'm, in, I'm tired if I'm filling out a form and I just, just say mixed. And other times I have more patience and more, and more time to actually you know, explain what, how I would like people to, to identify me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of issues with having to identify on a form for, for many reasons, whether it's political or um, 
that there's not enough space to even explain things, right? So one thing that I, I've worked in health research for a long time, and one thing that I've been saying for 20 years is like, you know, stats can, they, they, like, they make you choose like black or white, and, but then they'll break down a whole lot of other races and ethnicities, but black is just black. And I've always said like, okay, so what do I do with that? Like, I, I need to fill out multiple boxes here, but I don't have the option. It's starting to change now, but there was a lot of resistance in many research communities that this was like, well, what do we do with that? Um, or let's just recreate what Stats Can has done when we're doing other surveys within a, say a hospital or a community-based setting. Um, and it really doesn't allow for the, um, the tapestry that exists in a lot of, of mixed race people. Um, and, and then I, as you say, like whether you're tired or not, that, that comes into play. Like, do I really want to sort this out for somebody else's benefit um, or do I not? But, but I found as a mixed race person, there's a lot of political pieces to that too, in the sense that, you know, in some spaces people say, well, you can call yourself black. And in other spaces like, well, you're not black enough. And so what does that mean? And for me, it meant also growing up in Toronto in a predominantly black area is that when there were scholarships for black kids, I was like, well, I'm not going to apply for that. Right. Because at that age, I had to think, well, the purpose of that is for equity. And if I'm not facing the same barriers based on how people perceive me, then why should I go forward for that kind of scholarship and take that from somebody else? But these are the things that you grapple with because if I looked just slightly different, but with the same parental break, break, breakdown, someone would say, well, you should apply. Um, and I had to have to do that self-policing because of that mixed race identity. Mm -hmm. I totally hear you. Yeah. And, and though it's, it's funny in when, um, so Adele had invited everyone to, if you wanted, and I, I'm just going to repeat this, that if you, wish to, when we go into breakout rooms, be in an affinity group. So a group with other people who are racialized or indigenous to send Brian a message. But also, um, you know, when I first started attending sessions in affinity groups, um, I remember almost feeling like, well, people need to know why I'm here because maybe it's not obvious to them. And I remember uh, vividly, this is about 20 years ago, joining a group of, of other racialized women and saying like, oh, you know, actually, you know, my mom, and they were like, yeah, we know. And it's almost like, at least in my experience, a lot of racialized folk were like, yeah, we know you're one of us. We, we get that. And I didn't never realize that they, they saw me as, as one of them. Um, whereas I, with, um, with some of my white friends or, or white colleagues, there was kind of that assignment like, well, we're not sure really what she is, but we can't ask. Um, I think people of color, or racialized folk are more, more apt to ask a lot of the time, whereas um, or they'll ask us those kind of questions that will, you know, be a little annoying, like, where are you really from kind of questions. Sorry, my internet I can see is a little unstable, but <laughs> um, so, so sometimes they don't get as much to that point. And, and so that's been also hard where I feel like I have to almost defend in some ways and other times it's like oh it's just easier not to say anything and let people make assumptions. Yeah and and just when you cut out I guess I'll just reiterate like yeah. you're talking about that that concept of what are you right is that people say like what are you first like, with this curious look like you're a strange breed what are you um and then you'll answer and if it's not a fulsome enough explanation is like but where where are you really from like where where are you actually from and i don't think that that's specific to mixed race people's experience necessarily i think any racialized person in the canadian context faces some of those questions about where are you really from but what are you um i think is something that in particularly mixed race people faced because people can't figure you out um but you know on the other side like i think we have a bit of a mixed radar <laughs> i find like I know that that person's mixed, right? But it, it speaks to your point that it's very different um, depending on who is asking the question, whether that's a microaggression or whether that's a true invitation to community with someone else who has a shared experience, right? So it's a delicate uh, conversation piece for sure. Definitely. 
So Catherine, I'll ask you um, a second question, which is what have been your experiences within church settings related to your racial or cultural identity? Like what, what conversations have you had or what have your experiences been? Um, I'd have to say they didn't really happen all that much. Um, as a child, I grew up in, as I said, Presbyterian setting, fairly kind of multicultural, kind of reflective of the community in which I lived in, uh, in Scarborough. Um, so we had, um, we did have families from, who were Black from both uh, West Africa, but also from the Caribbean. We had other Indo, um, like Guyanese or Indo-Trini families, and then we had a lot of you know, waspy folks. Um, but the difference I think as a kid is that I would be there with parents who were, you know, very obviously one was brown and one was white. And so, so in those cases, um, I don't think race was really discussed all that much as a kid, um, but I was aware of it. I remember finding other people um, out once I started moving out and looking for congregations um, that would have at least a few people of color, so I wouldn't be the only one, but it wasn't always the case, generally in uh, white dominated spaces. Um, and I think just like anywhere, any place in Canada, there would often be the assumption that, well, she's white, and especially once I married my partner who is also white, um, you know, people would just kind of look at me and think, I don't know, I, maybe they thought it was Portuguese or something. I, I don't know what people thought I was because no one really asked outside of uh, my minister. And she and I would often have uh, very open conversations about race and about equity. Uh, she had a mixed race child. So she was, you know, she would ask me about my, some of my experiences. So um, in those settings, um, we started talking about it. I was also at the same time doing a lot of work uh, around white privilege. Um, and, and so we, one Sunday, uh, my minister and I did almost a conversation like this, where she and I got up and we talked about the concept of white privilege. And it was about oh, seven years ago, I think or so. So it was before the dialogue was out there as much. Um, and there was some pushback, I will say in the congregation uh, to the conversation and why are we talking about this? Um, but I was really glad to to be able to bring my whole self there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think I, I think she could see me, but I don't think everyone else did. And um, I wrote about one of my experiences in uh, my 40 days reflection um, and, and just the assumptions, because I think in a lot of religious communities and, and uh, in our United Church settings, you know, you just make the assumption, this is a place of comfort. This is a place where we all belong. So we maybe don't think about those things. And, and I think that's been some of my experience. And how mm -hmm. about you, Danielle? What have, have you experienced in church settings? Yeah, I think um, similarly, and largely it's not talked about. So I didn't grow up in the church in the sense that, um, you know, Guyana being a colonized nation um, was Catholic. And so my mother was raised Catholic, but did not want to put me into a Catholic church. So I, I was always seeking that spiritual home um, without my parents, like just doing that on my own. And so given where I lived in Toronto, I ended up in like Italian speaking churches, Catholic churches, um, definitely didn't feel like I fit, fit in there, had to figure out that I could even go to an English mass to figure out what was going on. Um, but then since then, like the United Church community was where I personally landed and that I chose because of the politic. Um, but then I found that it was predominantly white and it wasn't, nobody asked me what I was, because I guess it was presumed that I was white and it wasn't a topic for discussion. Even if I self-disclosed or self-identified, People are just sort of like, I don't know what to do with that. And they just carry on with the conversation. I was like, okay, I don't know why I said that, but you know, and but I knew why I said it, but I didn't expect the non-reaction. So that that was sometimes a challenge. Um, our church, uh, the church that I was uh, going to at the time, the United Church that I was going to at the time, did a shared summer program with different churches, um, including Baptist and Presbyterian congregations. And when I went to the Baptist church, it was a black female minister. And it was like predominantly black 
people in the congregation. And this is in Ottawa. So to me, it was sort of like, oh, this exists. Um, but yet the theology didn't line up for me. I found it really hard to digest the, that, that theology. And so I was sort of torn, like, do I go to a place where I feel like I belong racially or do I go to a place that I belong theologically? And I, I really struggled with that. So, you know, I, I find myself in the United Church and I've, I've changed congregations and in the congregation that I'm in right now or the faith community that I'm in right now, I'm able to have these discussions. Um, and that partly came from, you know, we have a white minister, but he was born in Kenya and he talks about that openly. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's at least an inroad to the conversation of who I am and what I might be looking for. Um, but even within that, it's been difficult to, to sort of have spaces for people of color to have conversations, not necessarily about race, but about spirituality in the context of that we are all racialized. Um, so th those have been my experiences, yeah, in, in, in brief. Yeah, I'm finding that um, where it's been lacking in, in, in terms of like congregation and getting kind of where I, who I am and where I fit, um, I, you know, I was lucky enough to, to get a spot on the anti-racism common table. Um, and a few weeks ago, we had our first meeting and um, just to be a, in, a, in a room literally sitting around a table talking about our experiences, um, primarily racialized folks, but not only, um, and just working toward anti-racism within this, this denomination is, uh, was, it was very uplifting and, and a, a good place to be. Um, but yeah, how do we find those places within our, our own faith communities, I guess is kind of the question. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I think at this point, Danielle, or will we be, yeah, we're going to be moving into our breakout rooms and uh, I, we're going to turn it over to Brian to explain things. Okay. So welcome back everyone. Um, I, we hope that you had a, a good conversation with your breakout room. Um, if there's anything that you would like to share with us, we'd invite you to write that into the chat, or if there's any questions that arose from the breakout room discussion, um, also we'd invite you to write that in the chat. So Danielle and I are going to continue with our conversation. And uh, Danielle, I think I get to put you in the hot seat again. Um, <laughs> So Danielle, how does or how has context or your location affected your experience as a mixed race person? Yeah, um, I would say in the past few years, I've understood the, um, the importance of understanding context and location more so now than ever before in my life. So as I said, I was born and raised in Toronto and lived there until I was about 30 years old. Um, and I now live in Ottawa. And growing up in Toronto, particularly in the neighborhoods that I grew up in, it, they were very mixed race neighborhoods. Like uh, you know, one of the neighborhoods, Oakwood St. Clair was named Rasta Pasta, right? Because there were so many black and Italians in that neighborhood. And so um, while I didn't necessarily fit in cleanly to any one group, there was enough um, different people in, in terms of race and ethnicity that you just sort of fit in with the whole milieu. So. Um, I often felt quite at home to be just just declare proudly that I was mixed race. Um, if anybody asked me as a child, um, there were only a few incidents of, you know, overt racism once people saw that I had a black mother. Um, and then as an adult, I moved to Ottawa um, and raising my children here. And also the neighborhood that I'm in is not very diverse. Um, it's predominantly white. And that has thrown me into its own little tailspin in the past few years of sort of saying like, why do I feel like such a fish out of water? And is it, is it like a class thing? Is it a race thing? Is it just my personality? I, and I, I couldn't put my finger on it. And so part of the reflection that I shared um, in the, in the um, 40 days of engagement reflection was that I've started to explore different spaces and realize that my own identity and feeling comfortable changes based on location, not only in terms of geography of like one city versus another, but also the spaces that I'm in within a city. Um, and so I give the example in my reflection about hiking in Gatineau Park. And, you know, here everyone talks, or at least everyone in, in the white neighborhood that I'm in talks about going to the Gats. It's the cool thing to do. Everyone goes to the Gats. 
Um, but I notice lots of microaggressions that go on in those spaces that are predominantly white spaces. So, you know, even on like a bike trail, if somebody who's a person of color is like veering off the path just a little bit, the, the real like stern glares they'll get from the regulars who go to the GATS, it's quite overt to me. And, and it makes me say like, is this a safe space? Is this a place where I want to declare with pride, I am mixed race, as opposed to how I would in, in Toronto. So I've come to realize that um, where I am and who I'm with definitely defines um, or determines how I identify. Um, and, and similarly, I've had to realize that my children are not necessarily going to identify in the same way that I identify because they're growing up in a different context. So I've realized that also as a mixed race person where people can like assume different things about me based on my skin color, sometimes I can blend in and sometimes I decide, no, I want to be out and proud and, and share this. So yeah, that's been my experience in terms of the context and location affecting my experience in terms of my racial identity. How about you, Catherine? Um, I found very similar kind of experiences. I, I often don't think about race when I'm walking down a street here in Toronto. Um, I just am here. Um, whereas, and I think because of just the multicultural aspect of, of the communities in which I'm, I'm moving through, um, I'm not all that conscious of it. Um, I, but again, it depends on where I go. So if I go into the Indian grocery store on Gerard Street, which is Little India here in Toronto, um, I kind of almost am like a little defensive, like, oh yeah, I do belong here, but I know I don't really. Um, and so so in, in a setting like that, whereas I, I wouldn't feel that way going through a Loblaws or a Sobeys or something. Not that I go to Sobeys, but um, I don't know why I said that about Sobeys, but there it is. Um, <laughs> I find that, you know, I just don't have those experiences here. When I leave, um, at least for me, when I sometimes am leaving the city or and going out a bit further afield, um, you know, stopping at a mall or walking down a main street, sometimes I'm more conscious and think, does everyone realize that I don't fit in here? And, and it's almost like I feel like there's a spotlight on me, um, which I know it's not. Um, I have had those experiences, though, being with my, my white partner and my kids who are pretty white appearing, um, that you know, how does, you know, I, I don't know really how others see me, but I know how they see them versus me. And, you know, I've had the experience where we've been at an airport and the random selection of the person who gets an extra security check has been me when the other three didn't. And, you know, it seems kind of, you know, you know, is it that I'm vaguely Arab looking or something? And I, you know, the paranoia goes up. So it, it all depends. It's, it's funny. Um, I was singing during, during the breakout rooms, we were talking a bit about uh, school context. And, um, and I was thinking about how early in my career um, at days of significance in our school community. So in the community in which I worked, uh, it was Diwali, it was Eid, but we did have a handful of Christian kids too. So it was kind of like almost like a third and third and third. Um, and the Hindu kids all made the assumption that I was Hindu because I understood and knew about Diwali and knew about the, um, their experiences. The Muslim kids, because I was the teacher who coordinated the, the uh, space away from the lunchroom for Ramadan and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then the Christian kids who were just, you know, they had picked up on the odd thing I had said about going to church or, or you know, getting ready for Advent or whatever. And how all, kids in, in all three groups made the assumption because they're all, kids are always looking for belonging. And they made that assumption that Miss Inglis must be one of those people who shares my identity. So it was actually really, um, you know, I didn't want to dispel them, but you know, a couple, at, once it got to, you know, Advent season and leading up to Christmas and kids would start saying, you know, what are you going to do during the break? And I'd say, oh, I'm going to, you know, there'll be church on Christmas Eve and I'll be doing this. And, and that's when everything kind of came out. Up to that point, I had all these kids who just wanted to make that assumption. And I mean, that was one of the, that's one of the nice parts about 
being ambiguous, I guess, um, is that that a lot of people make those connections and want to make connections. People, I think, ultimately, and, and with with kids, it's especially true. They're looking for what is that connection that I have to you, and mm-hmm. um, and so I think that was one of the good parts about me being that ambiguous race that also lent itself in in my school setting to to a faith community as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I think also what you're um, alluding to in terms of when people claim us in terms of um, like wanting to stake a claim and that kind of feels good because the sense of belonging, at least for me, is not always clear, right? Because in some communities you're, you know, not dark enough and in other communities you're not white enough. And so you often sort of feel like you're between two difficult places of trying to fit in. Um, and, and yet, as you say, like the number of Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, indigenous people who would be like, you're one of us. <laughs> like, I, I so want to say yes, because I want to belong somewhere. Um, but yes, because of the racial ambiguity, then there you really can fit in many places and yet nowhere at the same time. Eh? Well, when I've been teaching, I often throw in, I, I had, I took Hindi lessons. And so I got to learn a bit of of the mother tongue and when and and so I throw in little bits of Hindi when I'm teaching sometimes especially given that I have a lot of Nepali and Indian students I've had those students in my class and it's funny the kids right away will just be like miss you're speaking you're speaking Hindi how do you know this and they would just get right to the point their parents on the other hand I would have this kind of it's funny with adults it's so different um Last year, I remember having this, these lovely parents who I chatted with every morning when they dropped their daughters off. Um, and it wasn't until about two months into school when finally, uh, I'm going to say his name, Mr. Patel, came up and he was like, he was like Miss, you know, I, I'm wondering why is it you're speaking Hindi? Are, are you Indian? And I said, well, you know, I'm and, you know, and I kind of explained, I said, but I, I lived in India and, and I took these lessons and, you know, that he was all excited because now he, he had this connection. His daughter, so had figured it out, they were twins, uh, had figured it out in the you know, third day of school or something. So the kids don't have any qualms about just being like, hey, you're speaking my language, how is it? Yeah. Uh, and, or you know a bit about my culture. How do you know that? Mm-hmm. And is it because we have the same or is it just because you've learned? And so kids aren't afraid to ask a lot of that, those mm-hmm. questions. For sure. And, and so sort of going along that, that line of like people either seeing you or you feeling seen and feeling belonging, what have your experiences been in terms of creating or finding spaces of belonging as a mixed race person? That's a tough one. Um, it, it's funny, I guess, because of the high school I went to, which was predominantly white um university you know was fairly mixed um but my church community was fairly white and i married a white person um generally i i don't find that i either won't bring up race or i wait until i have that feeling of comfort to actually start talking about it so it's not something that is at the forefront um when when I'm building like my friend groups or anything like that. However, I do have a pretty multicultural friend base, which is, I think, a product of growing up in Toronto, uh, but also just maybe it's who I, I'm drawn to. Um, within spaces of where now as an adult that I'm getting to choose, so especially those union spaces where um, we can identify and go into affinity groupings, um, I often will choose to go to hang out with more of the racialized uh, women in those programs and and make those connections. But I still am often timid to do that, Mm -hmm. um, where I kind of find myself at the outside and saying like, oh, hey, yeah, I'm also, but not quite. And it's just, yeah, I get excited though when I meet other mixed race people, I have to say. Mm -hmm. I worked with a a mixed race teacher uh, last, for the last few years and, you know, as soon as I met him, I was like, you're one of my people. And it was funny, another guy on staff who was Jewish um, and uh, white Jew, 
he he went up to it. He was like, I think he's one of mine. And I was like, no, 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 he's mine. And we had him <laughs> going to him and saying like, who, who do you, you know, who do you belong to? And it turns out he was, he was like, like me, his, and Presbyterian too, um, though I am United Church now. Um, but he, but it was, it was funny. I, I often find those, those, um, those folks and teaching especially, um, I know that I've had mixed race kids over the years whose parents have been like, I'm so glad that they have someone who gets what what's happening. And while my experience in the eighties is definitely get, is definitely different than kids now. Um, my son just left for basketball and on his team, out of his team, I think they're almost every other kid is a mixed race kid, oh, like more than half the team. Um, I don't know how they identify exactly, but it's, it's just so much more common and the assumption almost is is oh, okay so what's the deal with that kid's parents oh okay you know and and you know we just talk about it more openly than than when i was young and i don't think i other than my sister i don't think i knew anyone who was the same mix as me until some of my cousins were born my second cousins were born uh my my indian cousins marrying uh white canadian um people so but that was, you know, when we were teenagers. So I don't remember meeting anyone. Um, yeah, it's it's funny how you, but you, it's it's funny how we do kind of find each other. On my street alone, there was one time where three of us, three of the parents on the street, identified as biracial, Indian, and white um, parents. And so we had all these these ambiguous kids running around and some of whom looked very white and then some who got like my son who got you know black hair um who looked a little less so so it, it's yeah I, I don't know if that really answered but you know creating and finding spaces of belonging i, I wonder for you uh danielle especially after moving to ottawa and go to a new context how have you found some of those spaces mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I've had to seek those spaces because they don't exist in the Ottawa context. Um, as you say, like Toronto is a very different context and the neighborhoods that I grew up in were, were very diverse. So my friends just all tended to be every color under the sun. Um, and that was just, I didn't know that it could be any different. I think I was probably 10 years old when it dawned on me that oh, maybe in other countries, everyone speaks the same language and is the same racial identity because I just assume that this is the norm in every place is that there's great diversity. So um, yeah, in, the, in a place like Ottawa, I've had to seek that. Um, but I guess I want to just go back a little bit to what you were saying is that it, it made me think about the fact that when you talked about, from what I understand in your parents, you grew up with both parents, it, my parents divorced and so I was raised by mom, my mom starting the age of 11 and uh, pretty exclusively and so I also realized that that some of that identity and context is um, where you're raised and who you are raised by right because my experience was growing up in a predominantly black community predominantly black schools raised by a perceived black mother. Um, and so I grew up in that context knowing that I looked different, but as it was at ease in those contexts. But I've also met other mixed race people who grew up in a white predominant com context raised by a white parent. And then they're trying to find their identity um, in, in a more racialized community. And it's like almost like a fish out of water in terms of trying to understand the new norm. So yeah, I thought that that's something um, that is often not spoken about that even sort of like, where do you identify more when you've, you've grown up in one or the other, uh, culture. And I see in the chat, some people are talking about sort of like mixed race children. And when a parent is not mixed race and has a mixed race child, how do you have those interactions? Can you talk about skin color? Um, you know, and, and as I said, in, in a place like Toronto talking about race, like I think, I think it's a Guyanese thing, but I don't know. But my mom would always identify people based on their race, like, oh, the Chinese kid, the Portuguese kid, the Italian kid. So I just thought that that was normal. And that's what we did around the dinner table. That's how we were talking about who we were talking about, because she didn't know the names of all the kids. And then I had to learn that in the white context, you do not do that. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. But I think because it made white people uncomfortable. 
And whereas we were a little bit more comfortable about talking about race and, and kids were more comfortable. Um, so in, in the question in the chat where, you know, do you find that are children in your classes, this is a question to you, Catherine, in your schoolwork, do you find that children in your classes are sensitive to skin color or as sensitive as some adults? Um, I think, again, I, I know the question is not posed to me, but my experience is that the context matters, too, is that when my darker child is in a white predominant school and comes home and people are talking about who is darker skinned, there's a very different connotation to that conversation versus in a more mixed race school with many different mixtures. Um, and, and it's just sort of a conversation about who's who and, and their ethnicities. Um, so yes, I didn't answer your question about creating a fine space. Maybe we can circle back to that, but I didn't know whether you wanted to con comment on some yeah. of those questions. Well, I, I think about um, the school. So I, I've just left the classroom, but um, the, the, the school I was at most recently is a truly multicultural school where, you know, the largest um, uh, group of kids would be about 20% or maybe 30%. And then there's another group and then there's another group. So we have kids from all over. Um, and in that, in that school, it was actually, I think about some of the in, beginning of the year activities, like doing self portraits and the arguments over who gets the brown uh, pencil crayons and who gets the light brown. And we would talk about different shades. And I was like, this color looks kind of like me. What do you guys think? And they were like, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's bit, you should go a bit darker, miss. And, or maybe a bit lighter. And then I'd have another kid say to me, oh, actually mine's like you, but, but I'm a bit browner or I'm like you, but you, you have a bit more yellow undertones. And like they would be talking about tones and all this kind of stuff. It was, I loved, I loved it. Um, it doesn't mean that that race wasn't an issue. Um, so I don't want to downplay it and say like it was, you know, this great Sesame Street, everyone gets along. Um, because that's not true. The mm -hmm. kids still, um, lesser at the younger grades, but you see it as, as the kids get older. And I was teaching grade four last year, but even by about grade six, kids starting to almost segregate um, mm -hmm. by uh, who they, they related to. Um, so you know, the Nepali kids would mostly hang out. And a part of it was also, I think, COVID to a degree where parents didn't want kids going to ho households they didn't know. Um, but also it's, it's that safety piece. You know, I know those parents because they're from the same community as us, so you can go to their house. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't a ton of mixing outside of school, outside of um, communities of, of origin, let's say. Um, but yeah, sensitive to skin color. I, I had one student last year and she was the oldest of three. Um, mom was black, dad is white. Um, and she was in grade four really becoming aware. And so we would read some books about, um, about there was this one book and I think it was called, oh, Adele, you might know the title. Um, it's something about like um, honey, Oh, it was, it was a beautiful book. Anyway, it was about a, a book where this child is looking to do a color and is describing themselves. And in the book, the child has a black mom and a white dad. And the child is looking for the right color to describe um, their own skin color and, and goes through mixing different shades of brown and, and peach and beige and all this and, and ends up creating their own color and renaming it. And the girl in the story had like big curly hair. And I remember reading it to the class and that girl was so excited. And, you know, I borrowed the book from the librarian and we weren't doing book sign-outs because of COVID and whatever. And I convinced the librarian to let me send the book home with her because she just really wanted to read it to her sister who was three and wouldn't have understood what was going on. But also her mom, I, I was able to chat with her mom about how important seeing herself was. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, um, I mean, Danielle, you and I had a talk about that before. We rarely saw each other ourselves on, on screen or as a character in a book growing up. I'd see parts of myself. I'd see characters who, with whom I could relate, you know, Anna Green Gables, sure, you know, her creative mind and her wacky, some of her wacky adventures. Sure, I could relate to that, but that wasn't the same as seeing myself and um, um, 
I would teach a lot about like books being mirrors or windows and and a lot of books were windows for me where I was seeing what someone else's life was like and I wasn't necessarily seeing that reflection of of um of what I experienced so that's something that I would try to provide as a teacher to make sure every kid can see themselves in their books but um it's 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 getting easier there are way more books that are out there that have um characters who are biracial um some tv shows even are, are doing things but but it's still you know i still get pretty excited when i see someone i'm like oh that's me i'm that same kind of person yeah i think there's definitely progress being made um for younger people because you know there are more mixed race people and i think we're starting to have these conversations but i think yeah you and i were part of that sort of in between generation where there was there weren't a whole lot of spaces created or conversations created and i think you know, for me, I, I, in terms of looking for or finding spaces of belonging, um, I actually went recently on a, a Buddhist retreat that was for the BIPOC community or Black, Indigenous or people of color. And I found, so it was a silent retreat. And so I thought once I signed up and I was ready to go, I'm like, why did I do this? Like, I have so many things I want to talk about with other people who identify in a similar way. And I've signed up for a silent retreat. Um, but what was wonderful about it is that, you know, before we went into silence, there was time to share. And I realized that in those few hours, we had such a shared experience, even though some people were mixed, some people weren't mixed, but they were different racial identities, that there was so much shared experience that I didn't need to explain anything. I didn't need to hear other people's views that much because they already aligned in terms of experiences and so then I could just be my spiritual self and have that spiritual experience of the retreat and the meditation because my mind wasn't racing the way it often is in other spaces where I'm the only person of color. And I'm thinking like, well, what's the privilege dynamic going on here? And why can I go on this retreat with these people, but other people of color can't? And I'm overthinking it. It allowed me to have that space to just be. And I realized that that really played into my spiritual well-being was having those spaces so I, I think for me um you know I've, I've worked on the anti-racism network group with the UCC and and sort of visioning what could be done and I think for me it's creating spaces for people of color to be spiritual together not just talking about race but just being our spiritual selves because all the other um conversations don't need to be had so explicitly because it's just a shared experience. So I think that that's become a passion project for me is sort of um, creating those spaces and, and you know, having those, those spaces for people of color. I know the United Church has done some circles for persons of color and those have been quite transformative for me. But um, yeah, I think, I don't think I would have sought that out had I not lived in the less diverse place that I am living right now. Mm -hmm. Um, we've had a couple more uh, comments in here about um, about security and and being randomly selected. So that's not an experience that I know I've only gone through. Um, and I, I, I remember talking to some students about that. Even uh, I had a student who he had broken his leg, and they put in a metal rod as mm -hmm. one of the ways to. It must have been a really bad break, and you know one of the kids said, oh, you're gonna get stopped at security. And I was like, well, look at this. And, and this kid had a very obviously Muslim name. And, and I said, yeah, that's gonna really be awful for you because you're probably gonna, you know, and I was thinking these things, he was grade eight. And so we were able to have a discussion about like, like having a Muslim name, but always setting off the, the detector, how that's going to uh, mm -hmm. impact him. He's probably 25 now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting um, uh, how someone had mentioned something in here. Um, so um, my kids are, I'm just going to read from this. My kids are mixed race. My wife, who is white, and, um, and I intentionally sent our kids to inner city, an inner city school environment, hoping that would help them learn racial diversity is normal. Yeah, and I get, it all depends on the school. I know when I was choosing, when we were choosing where to live, I actually, we went during a school day and I could see who was playing on the school ground. I thought, yeah, I could have my, if, if we have kids, they could play in the school ground. I would feel comfortable. 
Um, whereas I knew if I had gone further down the road into the beach neighborhood, for example, I don't know that it would have been as, uh, I would have felt as comfortable sending my kids there or being a mom in that community. Because mm -hmm. that's, you know, I have to look at it from that perspective. Um, so I'm going to keep reading. Uh, we comp we complimented, sorry, is that what it says? Yeah. yeah. I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> that teaching them about their cultural heritage, but emphasizing that is not their identity. As they grew up, each of our three children recognized how different they are, even from each other, and how they identify themselves. I've had that experience too. And Danielle, you mentioned that. I know that my sister was quite a bit more white appearing than I uh, was and never, not never, but not as frequently um, wrestled with some of these questions as I did. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think we, we often find that in families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the conversations have to be started with kids for them to even be able to explore it for sure. That's been my experience. So I know we had some large group discussion questions that we, we thought we could pose to the group. Um, and again, we, we invite you to reflect into the chat um, and we'll, we'll field those questions and, and try to um, perhaps respond or, or expand. Um, so if you have any general questions, just or throw those out there. Um, one of the things that we were curious about based on your experience here today um, is reflecting on our discussion, how might you interact differently than you may have done in the past with other people in general or within your church related to various aspects of people's racial identity. Um, so we'll give you a chance to just sort of reflect on that. So reflecting on the discussion we've had today, how might you interact differently than you may have done in the past with other people um, in general or within your church related to various aspects of their racial identity, including mixed race? Oh, while we're, people are mulling that over, um, I thought I'd just mention the term affinity groups, because I think that might be new to some, to some folks. So affinity group are basically, um, you know, groups where you have an affinity with someone else. So it might be um, a 2SLGBTQ plus uh, community uh, affinity group, uh, it could be a women's only space, it could be a space for uh, racialized folks. Um, and then it could be even, even smaller than that. So some of the spaces I've mentioned have been like spaces for racialized women specifically. Um, so just something that um, I thought I'd mention because it is a kind of an emerging term. Um, we used to say designated spaces perhaps, but affinity spaces has become um, kind of the, I don't know, nom de jour. Hmm. I know one person has said that they feel they might be more relaxed um, about raising or responding to questions about racial identity. And I, I know that um, I've even had more recent experiences where I, I think somebody's mixed race and I'm, I'm curious. And so I often, instead of saying like, are you mixed? I'm like, I am mixed and I'm sensing that, you know, there's maybe some similarities. So here's my mix. What's your mix? Um, and so I'll take the chance. And sometimes, you know, people are like, well, here it is. And they'll tell you the story. They might not be mixed, but they have some racial amb ambiguity that can be explained by their background. Um, but I've often felt that it's probably best to sort of talk about oneself and, and, and curiosities rather than asking somebody, so where are you from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So another question being asked, uh, do people want to be asked those personal questions from the small group questions? Um, it's important to encourage people to identify themse themselves or is asking rude. So yeah, I think that it would be a good conversation that we could have even now in terms of, you know, we asked you the questions, small groups about when you're asked a personal question, whether it's your gender identity, sexual orientation, that you know, it, it can parallel what it feels like as a racialized person being asked, where are you from? Um, and so I think it's a sensitive question, but I'm also of the notion is like, but if we don't ask it, we're assumed to be a certain way and presume that we are going to act a certain way. And it doesn't solve the problem either. It's just like, for me, it's like, we don't talk about it. And so I don't exist. I may as well not bring that up. So I'm not sure I have a clear answer. I don't know about you, Catherine. It's like, I don't know what the right way is to do it, but I know that not talking about it doesn't solve it for me. 
I, I think one of the things that you raised just a moment ago around, you know, self-identifying starting with us. So, you know, if my dad, who's white, were in a space and he wasn't sure about someone who's like, he might be wondering, oh, is that this person like my daughter? Um, but he, you know, for him to start out saying, you know, I, I'm Bob and, you know, yeah, my family's, um, you know, we're of Scottish descent and we're from Manitoba and we've been here for a few generations, you know, tell me a bit about your family or something like that. You know, it wouldn't be like the first thing he would say to someone. And I don't think my dad is all that curious to do that. But, you know, I think, um, I think to kind of, start with a, you know, I'm going to share a bit of who I am to open it up to you and not go straight to the, so where are you from? Because that, that assumes that we know that that person's white. They're, that it's that white privilege piece, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're assuming that I'm white. You're assuming that I'm Canadian. You're assuming all this stuff. So I don't need to even tell you because I'm normal. I'm from that, that you know, that, that standard. You must be different from that. So I think the way around it would be, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think as if you're a white person and you're curious to not jump into, don't jump into the deep end yet right away. You know, you want to go through that waiting pool a bit. Um, kind of feel where that person is. Do Is there a bit of a, a connection that you feel to that person? And if so, after a little while, maybe say, you know, I, I've been curious where, you know, my family is from, you know, is many generations of Scottish descent. I'm wondering about yours. You know, I think that could be a way, but to launch into it right away, I think is, is presumptive. Um, kids can do it though. I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> say that, that, you know, I, I've had like a grade three kid and be like, so, so where's your mom from? Who are like, what's, what's the deal? And I'm like, okay, I'll just tell you because you know, they don't have to have filters the way adults do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there. Set your grandchildren up or your children up to go and do these things. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, there's. A, <laughs> I know Gary. You were talking about the gray color. You know, you can have that. Do that. <laughs> it's such a difficult one because there is no no right answer. But you know, I, I do think about the fact that you know, if we put pronouns in our um, you know our Zoom Zoom chats, for example, it normalizes that we need to be conscious about diversity. Right. So, you know, whenever um, we put something out there, it's it's to assume that we don't know something about somebody else. Right. And so if we don't put pronouns, then I'm going to assume based on what you look like and make a presumption. And that's where I went wrong is because I presumed. Right. I've almost started using, you know, they them for a lot of people's pronouns because I'm not sure. And who am I to presume? And I think we have to approach um, ethnicity in the same way and racial identity in the same way. Like, how do you identify? Right. Because I, I think that, and maybe like if I were asked how I identify um, when it comes to, to my racial identity, I, it's a lot less intrusive than where are you from? Right. Like one feels like a, like a, I'm curious because I'm not going to assume, but I, you have to do that with everybody, right? Like it, it has to be that it's not that you pick out the one person of color and say, well, I'm curious about your identity. It, it's yeah. that we need to start having conversations about race in the same way that we're having conversations about gender identity and sexual orienta orientation. And, and so that we see that we are a tapestry and we can have those conversations not assuming that we know or that we assume that somebody is white or cisgendered or heterosexual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And um, it also depends now something just for, for those who are watching, just to be aware of is that safety also plays into this. So if, if I'm, if I'm in an all white space or what I presume to be an all white space and someone then turns to me and says, what's, what's your identity and they haven't asked others, you know, I might not feel so safe mm -hmm. to say, well, I, I don't want to, you know, say that I'm the one person of color here or the one racialized person. So it, it all depends where, and, and I think that's one of the things that we, and Danielle, like as being, both of us have had discussions about being white presenting, you know, sometimes people will just make that assumption and then other times they're like, I'm kind of thinking this, but I'm not positive. So I'm going to ask. But if you ask that one person that really almost puts a target on them and that mm -hmm. do doesn't necessarily mean um, 
doesn't necessarily mean it's a safe place for yeah. us to identify. And so, so sometimes I might be ba more vague if I'm not feeling as safe and I'll just say I'm mixed and just leave it at, at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to choose your moments wisely in terms of does it matter right now is one of the key things, right? Like if it doesn't matter to the context in which you're in, then there's no place for those types of con con conversations. Um, but because as you said, like somebody else outing you as a mixed person, I find there's a lot of parallels between somebody who is, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not homosexual, but if I were, I was, I'm thinking that there's a lot of parallels, like you choose when you want to identify, right? And so as opposed to someone who is, um, you know, very clearly racialized, darker skin, for example, they don't have the privilege that a mixed race person like myself has to say, like, am I going to disclose or not? And so I think there's a lot of parallels that also just explain that it's, it's a very messy business. There's no one right way to deal with it. And it's, it's a matter of like a lot of personal reflection, both as a mixed race person and someone interacting with a mixed race person um, that, you know, there's no one rule that we're going to give you tonight that says, this is how you do it. And this will solve problems um, because it is, it's a, it's a challenging thing. Yeah. Um, I want to just, uh, I think it was Gary had mentioned, um, and I think this was in response to what you were talking about being in uh, a single parent home. Uh, my parents also divorced, but my mom remarried another white <laughs> Scottish descent man. So in, you know, even if people didn't realize he wasn't my dad, I always had the appearance of a white, of a white parent and a brown parent. And so so that was always easy for people, not easy, but I never was called out for it or anything. Um, I was called some racial slurs as a kid. Um, there's a very uh, prominent one that was used in the 80s around from people from Pakistan and, and that trickled down and I, I got that and that was that was good times. Um, but, uh, you know, Gary mentioned some, something about also and I, Gary, he, he says, uh, yeah, I know something about that too. Um, my mom was never married and back in the 1950s, this was a big deal and I was called white trash and, um, and the, that term is in, in quotation. So, so having those slurs added on as compounding uh, issues of race. And uh, Gary, thank you for sharing um, on that. I know that that must have been, it must be hard and I don't know about you, but I know for me, I buried that for a long time and it wasn't until I you know, well into my teaching career that I started sharing that, yeah, this happened to me. I had a snowball in the face with, with an awful racial slur attached to it. Um, and, and going to my mom who didn't quite understand in, in how to react to that. And her reaction was something to the effect of, well, we're not from Pakistan. Our family's from Guyana. And I'm like, that doesn't help. Um, and having to, you know, as an adult, being able to look back and say, she just didn't know how to deal with it because she had come from a place where race was both, it was, it's both very multiracial and mixed, but at the same time, there were also race riots happening when she was a student in high school. So, you know, that, that, that racial harmony wasn't necessarily the whole picture for her, at least growing up. Um, yeah. Um, I also noticed that Noelle's co uh, comment, I guess the reason why children belong to the kingdom of God, they don't fuss much about color, unlike us adults. And I think that's true, Noelle. Um, you know, um, yeah, kids will come out straight up and, and just ask. And um, I remember being as, as a teenager, I was working at Shoppers Drug Mart. And this, I was at the cash one day and this woman was there with her white mom, white child and the kid said to a man in front of them in line mommy why is his skin so so dark and and you know you know and she she said it just because she was curious and obviously hadn't been you know around many racialized folks probably you know not not in school yet um because the community in which i was working was certainly multicultural and and the mom was so embarrassed and and apologized profoundly usually to this, this older black man and and he said you know that's fine my skin's different because I, my family comes from another part of the world where lots of us have this color skin and he was really just lovely and kind and and everything but 
there, there's definitely that fear that you could tell that that mom was fearful, you know, what does he think about me? What does, you know, what does this mean about how I've taught this child about what I've taught them about race or maybe what I haven't. And um, that fearlessness, um, I think sometimes, you know, as, as Noelle, you, you might agree, is, is kind of a blessing that, you know, we can have those open conversations. Another comment in the chat is, would one of us care to venture um, how the stories told tonight might differ or be similar to uh, kids or youth who are first or second generation whose parents are from the same ethnocultural or racialized community? Um, so I'm, I'm going to venture that my interpretation of that question is, what are the similarities and differences um, between mixed race kids experience versus racialized kids whose parents are the same ethnicity or race? Um, I find, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, in my experience, affinities between myself and, and other kids who are first or second generation um, immigrants where their, their parents are from the same community because we're people of color. And so we understand things. We can talk about our experiences with race and racism quite explicitly with each other. Um, I would say that having, and there's many different mixes that can go on, but my mix involves having a white Canadian father. And I would say one of the things that differs is that I straddled, you know, like there's the, um, the immigrant drive that often people talk about in terms of like doing your best so that you can get ahead in society. And then the sort of, at least from my, uh, my father's background was like, you know, we just want you to be happy and the sort of like laid back privilege that exists within um, the white Canadian experience. That's like it, it wasn't really concerned about keeping up and, and proving. And so there was a different fervor to what um, us as kids felt. So my, my friends whose parents were of similar backgrounds who, who came as immigrants to Canada, there was more of a push to them to say, you've got to get ahead. My mom had that similar push to me and my dad is just sort of like laissez faire. And that's, that's partly his personality, but I've noticed that, you know, just being in more white spaces that it's like, well, that is part of that white privilege that, that there isn't that same push on those kids. What are your thoughts, Catherine? I, very similar, very similar um, experience where, um, you know, definitely, especially we were the first ones, my mom's was the first of her siblings to come to Canada. So I think there was definitely that, you know, she had to have the house, she had to have the job, she had to have the kids who were doing well in school and all that kind of stuff. Um, whereas, yeah, in, in my dad's side of the family, my sister and I were the first to go to university. So a different kind of thing. Whereas, you know, we were like, you know, my uncle had gone to university on the Guyanese side, you know, he was a, uh, what do you call it? Fulbright scholar, all that kind of stuff, like very high achieving. So yeah, different thing. I, I recently was exposed to um, an idea called two-eyed seeing, mm -hmm. and it's a, a Mi'kmaq um, thing uh, with uh, Rebecca Thomas has a really good um, TED talk on it. Mm -hmm. And that while it was from a, a Mi'kmaq indigenous perspective, I really resonated with it as being in two worlds. And when I, when I first heard about it, I really thought this applies to biracial folks. And, and the group I was watching with were primarily racialized women, uh, many of whom were indigenous, many of whom were, were um, of, of one race. And then there are a few of us who are mixed race and, and especially the mixed race group, a lot of us were like, yeah, yeah, this is, a lot of what we've experienced over over our years. So that was a two-eyed scene I would recommend. And Adele I saw was shaking her head or nodding her head. So um, a really uh, interesting concept that I think really encompasses a lot of what we've been talking about here tonight. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I, I had heard of two-eyed seeing uh, probably a couple of years ago and I thought, mm -hmm. yeah. And with that for me personally is the responsibility to speak in both worlds. Right. As, is that, you know, as much as I'd like to just be in affinity groups and, and that's where I feel at home, 
when you look at a lot of the great um, speakers and leaders, like people like Barack Obama and others, like they're, they're said to be black, but they're actually mixed race, right? And I think it's because they can straddle the worlds to communicate with both. And so I take that on as a personal responsibility. Like as much as I just want to be comfortable, I have a responsibility to try to, to speak across those worlds. So, you know, Catherine, thank you so much. It's been so awesome chatting with you informally in this way. I hope that uh, people in the audience uh, got something from the talk um, and, and perhaps learned something, but uh, it was a really pleasure for me to get to know you a little bit better. You too. And, and I'm so glad Adele that you paired us together and we got to, to meet one another and, you know, um, at some point we will meet in person. Yes, for sure. Thanks Adele. Over to you Adele. Wonderful. And thank you, Catherine and Danielle for this great conversation this morning for uh, sharing some of your personal stories and reflecting on identity. Very much appreciated with such an engaging time. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here this evening. Um, uh, again, this gathering is recorded so you can watch it again if you'd like. Um, and please feel free to share with interested others. And uh, if you go to the website for the 40 days, you can find more written reflections and links to other 40 days events as well. So thanks again, everyone, and hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Blessings on your journeys.